Okay, I'm here. Pastor Brian was running the golf outing, and about midway of the week, I looked into his eyes, and he looked troubled. It was a big undertaking, and I said, Pastor Brian, you're supposed to preach Sunday morning. Do you want me to do that? He goes, and I said, okay, so here I am. <laughs> well, I've been preaching another time. I love that guy. Uh, he's the most detailed pastor uh, on staff, and I am the most, no, I'm not. Luke's the most undetailed person. <laughs> and uh, where's Jenna at? I don't know. I saw her here sitting there. Yeah, and I'm, I'm right there with him. So uh, take your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 3. Thank you guys for giving. If you're visiting, we never invite you here for your money. We want to give you something, and that's the, the love of God and the gift of Jesus that he gave to us so freely. And uh, God doesn't want you to, to be stuck in your sin. He doesn't want you to be stuck in your old patterns of this world. He wants to set you free, and he wants you to, to really know the joy and the freshness and the peace that comes through a really living relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, so that's my heart for you today. I, I bring this message to you as you turn to Colossians in the New Testament, a letter of the Apostle Paul to the church at Colossae. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 16 in a minute. I bring this message to you with, with a little heavy heart and to say that in or around America, I think that America has watered down Christianity and what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus, to being a Sunday morning religion, to being uh, a belief system in the head, to being an intellectual understanding of a plan of a salvation by understanding the terminologies of words like faith and grace, justification, righteousness, etc. But this whole thing about Christianity is something as so simple as having a friend that you're alert to, that you give time to, that you spend time with, that you listen to, that you talk to, that you read his letters and you meditate upon that he is in your life living every day. I ask myself, what does a, a person that's truly saved look like? What does that really look like? And I, when I came up with that, I, I thought to myself, it makes me fearful that we have people in America that are, have Sunday morning religion, but they don't have Monday morning Christianity. Because I think a person that's truly born again by the Spirit when Jesus Christ lives in them is a person that loves the Word, that takes time for God, that meditates on His Word, that reads the Word, that talks to God, that tries to listen to God, that cares about the church and other fellow believers, that comes to give what they can give to encourage and build up others and aren't just looking what the church can do for them. They're people that care about every person they see and have God's eyes to see what God sees and feel what God feels. They're concerned about their eternal souls. It's people that don't just come out of habit and write a certain amount and put in the offering, but that their lives are willing to do whatever and give whatever as God would call them, not only of their treasure, but of their time and of their talent. It's a person that their life moves and has its being in Jesus Christ like Paul says. It is a person that is truly devoted to the things of God and as naturally as breathing in and breathing out, they walk with God in a supernatural way that's actually very natural. And I ask you today to honestly ask God in his spirit, am I a child of God? Am I following Jesus daily? Is Jesus in my life? And I understand that you can measure if you're really honest and you're going to remember things where you failed. I do. I, I, I don't want to. And I keep thinking, I mean, there's been days I've lived pretty perfect, but there hasn't been many weeks, you know. But God doesn't want us to 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 have the lower expectation that we're just weak and we can't help it and we're going to just sin because then we come up with this sentence which is such an absolute slap in the face of God that says, well, everyone sins. I have my sin. You have your sins. What am I going to do about it? I can't help it. That's baloney. That's world religion. That is not Christianity. 
God doesn't want you stuck. He wants you to be an overcomer in the power of the name of Jesus and the power of his spirit through the quickening of his word. We are not called to be weak and wallow around and, and crawl into heaven. We're to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, soldiers of the cross. We're to be mighty through the pulling down of strong, strongholds by the same spirit that lives in us that lived in Christ Jesus. And so today I want to challenge you because I believe that the 21st century church has turned into a huge number of, Monday, of Sunday morning religionists and not Monday morning Christians. And there's nothing wrong with coming on Sunday morning and being a part of the right thing to worship God. But too many people, that's all they have. Someone wrote these words about it. They said, they're praising God on Sunday, but they'll be all right on Monday. It's just a little habit they've acquired. Well, that's a sad commentary, isn't it? We come to church to worship God on Sunday, and we should. But it shouldn't be just then. It should be throughout the week. You see, the Bible teaches that when we're right with God, that every day is a holiday. Every deed is a sacred thing. And it's a, it's a sacred act. And, and, and that everything we do, we should do to the glory of God. As we pick up in chapter uh, 3 of Colossians, verse 16, we read, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. That, that definitely describes a church service. The word of God, sharing it, talking about it, admonishing, teaching, letting it be rich in you, singing and worshiping and having gratitude in your heart. The King James says grace in your hearts. I, I think that definitely is a, is a great thing. It's a beautiful thing, and I've sure enjoyed communion. I enjoyed the presence of God. I enjoyed the gathering. I enjoyed just, just the, the warmth of his spirit that's among us. But God wants us to have Monday morning Christianity. And here's the wonderful thing about worship here that we talk about is someone might be able to give more than you. Someone might be able to teach better than you. Someone might be able to understand the Bible better than you. Someone <clears throat> might be able to sing better than you, but guess what? Nobody can worship better than you. The smallest child with a sincere heart, a simple heart, a heart of God, a heart of love to God that just is in a simple way reaches up and worships God is what God wants. You know, it's not some magic bullet. It's not trying to learn how to act, you know. You ought to be the same on Monday as you are on Sunday. I know if you've met preachers, I have, you talk to them but in the foyer and they talk one way and they get in the pulpit and they start talking and you think they swallowed a steeple the way they talk. You know what I'm saying? God. I'm a part of the assemblies of God. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you right now that God is in this place. It's the only place he's at, but he's there. I might as well say that because that kind of fake bake doesn't trip my trigger. And yet, in so many ways, in our own different way that's not quite that weird, sometimes we can go out in the world and we aren't the same on Monday through Saturday as we are on Sunday. And God just wants us to simply worship him and take our worship to the world. And we come back, we've been worshiping all week, and we bring our worship with us into this place to exalt Jesus Christ and to worship God. You know why God wants us to worship him? Because you become like the one you worship. It shapes you. And we need to be worshiping Jesus Christ and him alone first, You're letting God get all the glory and everything to give God the glory. Worship extends to all of life, and uh, uh, we, we, we need to understand, if you look at verse 17, the conjunction, uh, picking up from verse 16, which is the worship service, if you could let me just read it again, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with gratitude in your heart to the Lord. How wonderful that is. And then look at the conjunction there. Look how it ties it together, and whatsoever you do, and whatsoever you do. This is going beyond Sunday. It's going beyond the worship service. Whatsoever you do in word or do, deed, rather, in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. 
all, do all, all, not part, all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. In other words, real worship extends to every life, every deed, every day. See, worship is, is, is doing everything in the name of Jesus and giving God the glory for it. Whether you're brushing your teeth, anything you do, that, you know, your heart is about God. It's not, it's not, we think of worship as singing a song or saying words, but worship is, is our life to God and our thoughts to God in everywhere we go. Awareness of his presence. Um, so, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, just write this in the margin. It's kind of in the middle of the verse, if you look right in the middle, that God in all things may be glorified through Christ Jesus. Notice that, that God in all things things. Mark that down and write, write, underline that, 1 Peter 4, 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, look at this. Whether, where, where, whether you, therefore you eat a hot dog, a hamburger, or chili, or you drink lemonade or iced tea, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's the Weaver version. And whether you're eating or drinking, whatever you do, you're eating your lunch, it ought to be for the glory of God in everything you do. One homemaker had this sign over the kitchen sink. It read this way. It says, divine services held here three times a day doing dishes, divine services. And so it, you, everything is for the glory of God. And that's what it says. Whether you eat or whether you drink, whatsoever you do, do it all, A-L-L, -L, all to the glory of God. You see, the so-called secular then is sanctified when everything is to the glory of God. The everyday is edified. The God is glorified. And so uh, that's what we need to do. We leave this beautiful sanctuary to worship God in, and you go out under the canopy of the blue skies, and you see that God is there, that you're mindful of him, and your worship extends to every day in a natural way that all that you do is, is about God and giving glory to God. I say if you want to really give glory to God, listen to God, ask him to let you see what he sees and feel about it the way he does. It'll bring you to your knees to pray. It'll bring you to your feet to praise. That's what we need to be about, worship and prayer and, of the, and in the word of God. So uh, it says, whatever you do, do all in the name of Jesus, verse 17. So how do we know that what we're doing is done in the name of Jesus? So I give you three questions to write down that'll answer that question. Are you doing everything for the glory of Jesus, to worship Jesus? Number one, is what you're doing consistent with the personality of Jesus? Is it consistent with the personality of Jesus Christ or the character? You cannot separate the name and the character of Jesus Christ. They are inextricably uh, woven together, interwoven. Uh, when I was a kid, there were baseball bats. They were, uh, what was the brand? Louisville Sluggers. You ever had one of those? I was on a little league team in 1965, and we were good. I mean, I was great, but my team was even better than me. And the older I get, the greater I was. I played first base. They would hit home runs, and I would hit singles. But I would uh, get on either on an error or a little dribbly little hit or something, but I'd get on, and then they'd hit a home run, not me. In fact, Larry Williams hit four home runs in a row with those wooden bats, not metal bats, Fences just as long as they are now in Little League, we'd knock them about 300, I, I say we, I, I didn't, they did, 300 feet over the fence. We, we hit 37 home runs in 12 games, 37. Went to the Little League World Series, and we were the best team even though we got beat one to nothing. It was a fluke. We'd play them again 100 times, we'd beat them 90, 99 out of 100 every time. Windsor Lock, Connecticut, they cheated. They had some sort of something. I don't know. It was probably a, a ball magnet in their glove. I'm not sure I figured out how that is. We hit it hard right at them every time. But anyway, those bats, when I'd go get one of those Louisville Sluggers, I was looking for one with a signature on it. Roger Maris, I mean, you know, a Yankee, they were the only thing on television besides the Cardinals, and they stink. So we're looking for Roger Maris or a Mickey Mantle bat or a Yogi Bear bat, one of those guys, you know, with their signature. Why? 
because their name was on it and it was saying they approve. The stamp of approval is on this product from these guys <clears throat> that were great players. <clears throat> and so if, if they had, that was their bat, I could hit with that sucker, so it gave me confidence. Let me tell you something, the name of Jesus should be stamped on everything you do, his approval. The stamp of approval, his name written, you do it in the name of Jesus, that's what matters. That whatever you're doing, that Jesus would check off on it and give his stamp of approval, that he is signature upon your life, on your behavior, and everything you do. So if you're thinking about doing something that Jesus could put his name on it, ask that question, could he? Could he put his stamp on it? Would he sign off on it? Would he put his name on that? Is it consistent with the personality of Jesus, with the character of Jesus? Is it consistent with who he is? Will, would he indeed sign off on it? So he says in verse 17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all, all in the name of Jesus Christ. Is it consistent with the character, the personality of Jesus Christ? You see, people are always asking me, can I do this? Is this wrong? Would it, is this bad? And they're going to get detailed about it. Well, this book is not a book of laws of the minute details. Otherwise, you'd have to have many freight trains to carry it around to have every little letter and detail. God has by his spirit written the word and the truth upon you, and he will guide you in all truth, and he'll show you what is in the light and what is in darkness. You don't need that. People that are always wanting to know if it's okay are just looking to see what they can get away with and still make it to heaven by the skin of their teeth. And that's not the spirit of a person that's truly been born again that has Jesus Christ in their life. Are you with me? It's not how, how close can we live to the world and look like them, but how much can we look like God, his love and his light and his truth. For he's a holy God and his spirit is a holy spirit and we has a holy people that are peculiar, called out of darkness into his glorious light. That's the point. But I'm going to tell you something. <clears throat> it's When we look at this book, God's not giving you detail, every little detail, little minute law details. <clears throat> For instance, Paul says that uh, not to eat meat that's been offered to idols. Or he, talk, he addresses this, this whole deal. If it's offends someone that's weaker, don't be messing with it. And he's talk, you know, there's a whole history behind that. <clears throat> and that doesn't even make sense to most people in our culture. He deals with that as an example to teach that it's okay to let go of your rights so that you can serve God. You're a privilege or something that's not between you and God a sin that you give up so you can have influence with other people. That's a godly way to look at that. <clears throat> and Paul deals with that. But guess what? Paul never said in, the, in his letters, thou shalt not watch X-rated movies. He doesn't he didn't go into our culture and talk about things that are relevant today about cell phones and so forth. You understand what I'm saying? He doesn't have to. See, the Holy Spirit gives the light and the truth. There is a way that we should live. So, am I too loud? Okay. I sometimes am loud to myself. I'm a loud person. I'm sorry. This is my mother's fault. Mom, it's your fault. You were too quiet. And I had to be loud. It's not her fault. I was just kidding. But I tell you, I've offended people being loud. I apologize for that. So it's, it's a book of principles. It's, it's a book of his spirit. It's, it's a book of, of God revealing himself so that Christ in us guides us. A Holy Spirit, that's the answer, guys. We need to be real and we need to understand. We need to ask ourselves: is what we're doing consistent with the principles of Jesus Christ, of his character, of his personality? So, you know, there's one little boy on, on, on the deck of a commuter train uh, in the waiting area and he's selling his little goods, had all kinds of things out there and, and the train was late and one gentleman that was heading to work went running by and bumped and knocked his table over, knocked all of his money, the money went rolling this way, all of his product just went everywhere and started flying around and people just going by him until one man stopped, dressed very nice, he had his briefcase, he set it down, he got on his knees in his suit, he began to pick things up and try to help the little boy put it all back together and when he got done, he pulled out a large bill, he said, here, he said, I want to give you this for the loss of things, hopefully this will help pay for some of this to bless you. 
And the little boy says, thank you, mister. And then we started to go away. He said, hey, mister, are you Jesus Christ? He said, no, but I'm a follower of Jesus, and I try to do what I think he might like me to do. And that's it right there. Does, does what, all that we do, does it reflect the character and the personality of Jesus Christ? That's what it means by what you do, do all in the name of Jesus. In other words, his name's sake is at stake when you call yourself Christ, Christians, Christians. Jesus. And so let's, let's be, begin to live as Monday morning Christians and not Sunday morning religionists. Number two, the second question to ask yourself to see about if this is all in the name of Jesus that we do is does it claim the power of Jesus Christ? Is it consistent with the personality of Jesus and is it consistent with the power of Jesus? Because a name stands not only for personality but power and authority. Now, why am I saying this? Because this verse, these verses go on down and begins to hit the, where the, the rubber meets the road. It begins to deal with family relationships and employee, employer. And to be able to live out how God wants you to live, you need the power of Jesus Christ in your life. You see, he doesn't ask you to do something he doesn't empower you to do. It's him doing it for you and in you if you will just Take the time to invite him in, pay attention to him, and let him be a part of your life. It's not hard. It's not banging your head, climbing a mountain, wallowing on your belly. It's just being and being with Jesus Christ. And God help us, everyone. You see, in John 14, 14, Jesus said something here. He says, if you ask, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. When we bring his name into it, he does it when we bring Jesus to the, yes, in a sense, he helps us to do it, but it's more than that. He in us accomplishes through us what he desires for us. He doesn't give us these instructions and sit back and go, let's see how good you do it because our nature is sinful and we will fail. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. You have his name, his authority behind you. In Jesus, he will accomplish his will in your life. Now look, if I write you a check and I put my name on it and I give it to you, take it to the bank, what does my name mean? It means there's authority for that check for the banker to give you money out of my account. A little signature. It's the name of Jesus. There's authority in it. There's power and authority in putting that name on it. And let me tell you something. You're a child of God. You're a brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is in you. He has given you authority to tread on scorpions. He's given you authority in the name of Jesus that demons will flee. There's no, there's pulling down the strongholds by the Spirit of God through Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, there is a power in his name and authority. You have it. You say, well, what are you saying about this authority? Well, uh, let me ask you this. A, an officer is 180 pounds and he comes up and he's in the middle of the road and he puts his hand out to stop a semi. I mean, that's, that's not strength. That's authority. That's a power authority. There's a verse, if you look in Luke and mark it down, Luke 10, starting in verse 17, Jesus is sending out 70 people to represent him in those early days of his ministry. And the Bible says, beginning in verse 17, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Even the devils, the demons, are subject to us through your name. And he said to them, I beheld Satan as a lightning falling from heaven. Behold, I give you unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That first word, power, is a Greek word that means authority. The second word is dunamis. It means strength or power. And, 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 and so the Satan's got certain power, and you're no, you're no match for him. What he's really saying is, I give you authority over the power of Satan. That's what he's saying. I'm, you got authority over that, that man. He may have power and can have things that he can do, but in Jesus' name, there's authority that you take with you against all the forces of evil. The King James translates, I give you, quote, power over, quote, power of the enemy. But there, the NIV says authority, if you'll look at verse 19, is a it's Jesus gives us the power of authority over the power of our strength or might of the enemy. 
And so remember, you have the authority of Jesus Christ behind you in all that you do and the strength. And so when you go out to live for God, let God's spirit and power flow through you to help you. And if you don't take time for it, you won't have it. Now, does it portray the personality of Jesus? Does it claim the power of Christ? That means everything you do, to, you're to do it in the authority of Jesus. You're to rear your children in the authority of Jesus, your homework as a child in the authority of Jesus, obey your parents, treat your wife right, treat your husband right, all in the name of Jesus. Whatever you do, do all in the name of Jesus Christ. And so is it consistent with the character or the person of Jesus Christ, and does it claim the power of Christ? So it gets personal now in verse 18, 318 of Colossians. Wives, well, submit yourselves unto your own husband as it's fit in the Lord. Submit yourselves to your own husbands in the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Submit to your husband in the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And this is not slavery. It's not subjugation. Listen to me. Men and women both listen. It's not demeaning. Do you know what biblical submission is? It's two equals that one of the equals willingly subjects himself to the authority of the other. For the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 in Christ there's no Jew nor Greek, there's not bond nor free, neither male nor female, for you're all in Christ Jesus. No male or female. Women and men, they're equal. But for the glory of God, one equal subjects himself to another that the God might be glorified, and that takes the the name of Jesus and the authority of Jesus to do that by the Spirit of God because human nature is not ever to put yourself in subjection to someone else. And then it says, husbands, by the same authority, the power of Jesus Christ, it goes on, it says, you're to love your wives and not bitter against them in verse 19. In Ephesians 5, and in verse 25, it says, husbands are to love their wives as Christ, love the church and gave himself for it. That word is agape love, God love, and that word is sacrificial love. A wife loves by uh, serving. A wife loves by being subservient willingly. And a husband has to love by sacrificing. And it's a huge responsibility for a man to be delegated by his wife to say, I will follow your spiritual leader. You're my leader. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk with you. I'm going to support you. We're going to do this together. You know, I ask myself, a man that doesn't pray with his kids, that's not responsible and, and to make sure that his kids are saved and, and to teach them the Bible and doesn't pray with their spouse, what, what kind of Christianity is that? Is that Sunday morning religion? Or is that a living relationship with Jesus Christ where your heart is pounding the fact that you want all people to not just know about Jesus, but walk with Jesus? And this whole relational stuff with the family here is all in line with this whole idea of giving God the glory and everything. You see a family that's in order where a wife is in submission and a husband is loving as Christ loved and gave himself and preferring her in every way in love and never demeans her, never puts her down, but actually Actually, as Jesus gave himself and we're the apple of his eye, he is Jesus to her. And that woman never, ever would have any fear at all of walking alongside and following a man that loves her like that. That gives glory. you talking about worship in the real world. It's seen in a family that does that. Only in the power of the name of Jesus Christ can we do that. And only the power of Jesus' name can I love Susan. Now, I don't mean it because she's difficult to love, but I mean the way God wants us to love. I know what some of you were thinking. And, uh, and, and trust me, there's only, only by God's love could she uh, to return that love. So it, we, the God has given us authority and power in our life to love our wives and to respect our husbands, to reverence them, to, to, to be proud of them and to walk together. And children, verse 20, are to obey in the name of Jesus. Children, obey your parents. Look, in all, there it is, all things. There's a word again, not when you agree. Listen to me, teenager. I don't care what you think. Children, obey your parents in all, all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. The measure of your obedience is, and it is the measure of you pleasing God. You're, you're pleasing the Lord and you're obeying your parents. A disobedient child is not worshiping God. He doesn't, you know, there's no Monday morning Christianity. You can go to church, go to youth group, you can sing, you can have your music that you like and all that. But when you go home and you're disobedient to your parents, you talk back, you don't do what you're supposed to do, it displeases God. It's not worshiping God at home. I wish we had 
more children that would follow the one, the one of the commandments. There's 10 of them. They're big things. That's why they're called the 10 commandments. You know, honor your mother and father. Obey your parents and the Lord. It's right. And I'll tell you, it says in verse 21, fathers provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. Colossians 3, 21. The word actually there in the original language is parents, not fathers. It's not talking only to the father. It's talking about to, to parents, but as a father, I got a two-year-old. Well, my, I'm big anyway. They're two foot tall, whatever. If I yell, but I raise my voice or swat or whatever, you got to be careful. Let me tell you something. A, a, a great kids from, come from hearts of a daddy that's tender with their kids. Gruffness is not going to help your kids. Be tender and teach them. Uh, uh, you know, children by nature don't know everything until you redirect them. You can't be overly gruff, and you need to be demanding and stern and, and clear, but you got to do it in love and, and, and with wisdom. And uh, so don't provoke the children. Be tender. Learn the technique of tenderness. And, uh, and if you do it, you learn it in the name of Jesus by the Spirit of God. And then he addresses employees. Verse 22 and 23, servants, obey in all things your masters. Notice how many times he says all. Servants, all. All things. In other words, as an employee, well, he goes on. He says, whatever. And notice how he says, I mean, he says, whatever you do, do all, verse 22 and 23, do all in the name of Jesus. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Here it is again, and whatsoever you do, everything, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto, unto men. Heartily with enthusiasm. You say, for that two-legged devil I work for? Yeah. That's how you change a person. You know, every boss ought to say, I want one of them Christians. They get to work on time. They don't complain. They work hard. They serve. They go the extra mile. They're honest. They're sacrificial. And I, I can trust them with anything. I don't know what they have, but boy, I won't want to hire one of those Christian people. Are you different from those around you? We look so much like people that don't even believe in God. We even compliment, well, they're good people. They don't go to church. They're atheists. They're good people. Oh, yeah, they have a different lifestyle. They sin, but they're good people. Let me tell you what. Listen to me very, very clear. Sinners can be good people. Mark it down. But sinners without Jesus are not going to be received into heaven. We stand condemned already in darkness. Death is our sentence. And only Jesus Christ can change us and save us. And you can have a lot of good in a lot of people who are away from God, who live a lifestyle of sin. And I'm going to tell you, God is never going, to, never going to leave you, and he'll help you. You need to be different. We need to be Monday morning Christians. You say, well, I don't get paid enough to act like that and do all that extra stuff where I work. Well, notice this, verse 24. Colossians 3, 24, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of your inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Remember, nothing you do is missed even if you give a cup of cold water in my name. He sees it. He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God will not be a debtor to you. He sees all that you do, good and the bad. And wouldn't it be wonderful if employers and employees lived this way on Monday morning? Would you bow your head with me? Does doing everything in the name of Jesus, is what you're doing consistent with the character of the person of Jesus, the personality? Does it claim the power, the authority of Jesus? And last thing, does it culminate in the praise of Jesus? In other words, everything you do points to Jesus that God gets the glory. It's not about me. It's not about you. Cleaning my room to obey my parent is a worship to God. Driving like my parents expect me to drive is a worship to God. The way I love my wife, my husband, the way I treat my children, the way I do my homework at school, for school, is a worship to God. For it reflects the glory and it points that Jesus Christ is important to you and you're worshiping him in everything you do. God wants every day to be edified. He wants the secular to be sanctified. He wants in all things God to be glorified. 
every day to be a holy day and every place a sacred place. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all for the glory of God. You're here this morning and you need Jesus Christ in a greater way that it affects your Monday through Saturday, that your life is lived as worship to God if you're here. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you just say, God, help me to bring glory and worship to you throughout the week that it's not just a Sunday morning religion, but a Monday morning Christianity that I live. Would you lift your hand? Thank you all over this place. I pray right now as these people are reaching up to you, Jesus, you'd be real. Can we just keep it simple, Lord Jesus? We would just take time for you, listen to you, spend time in your word. Help us, Jesus, to hear your voice, to talk with you, be called into your presence, to be filled with your power and glory, that by your power and might, Lord Jesus, we might reflect your glory. We're not called in the darkness, but into the glorious light as a peculiar people, that we might be called Christian because we reflect Jesus the Christ. Not because we go to a a Sunday religion service, about Christ. Fill us, Jesus. You're here and you're not sure you're ready for heaven and you want Jesus to forgive your sin. You want to receive Jesus and his gift of eternal life. Would you just lift your hand quickly? Every head bowed, yes. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just lift your hand and say quickly, say, yes, I need Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. Jesus, yes, Jesus, save. Jesus, save from the power of sin. Jesus, forgive the penalty of sin. I pray Jesus, save from the, from the power of sin and forgive the penalty of sin. And may you send your grace and mercy to these, God. Come into their hearts with your fullness, Jesus, as they give their lives to you and say, God, from now on, it's your way, not my way. I take up my cross to follow you, not my way. I die to myself, my will my purposes for your glory and your purpose thy kingdom come thy will be done in Jesus we pray